justice seeks, a serpent coils, its shadows reek. Qualified immunity, a cloak so wide, hides misdeeds in its murky tide. The lassies weep, their rights denied, as power's shield stands tall with pride. No recompense for the wrongs they bear, while the haggis of justice sobs in despair. Let fairness reign, let truth be known, banish the cloak that evil has sown, for in its absence justice shall rise, and the lassie's tears turn to hopeful skies. Hello, and welcome to Short Circuit, your podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeals. I'm your host, Anthony Sanders, director of the Center for Judicial Engagement at the Institute for Justice. We're recording this, and hopefully, if editing goes well, releasing it on January 25th, 2024. Why do I emphasize it is January 25th? Because that has a lot to do with that out-of-nowhere poem that you heard to start the show. January 25th is the birthday of Scotland's favorite poet, Robert Burns. And many of you may not know this for our predominantly American audience, but all across Scotland tonight and all across the Scottish diaspora, and indeed just friends of Scotland, people get together in pubs, in homes, and wherever to recite the poetry and sing the songs of Robert Burns. Why do they do this? God knows, something to do with Scotland and his connection with the rolling hills and the streets of Edinburgh and all the things that he wrote about way back in the 1780s and 1790s. It is a a joyous occasion. Uh, If you've ever been to a a Burns night or a Burns supper where they eat haggis and drink whiskey and, and all that good stuff. And so we wanted to just bring a little bit of that joy to short circuit. Now, Robert Burns himself, I got to admit, did not have a heck of a lot to do with the law or, um, you know, the American Constitution or anything like that. He was a little bit of a radical. He, he got in trouble with some things he said about the French Revolution at the, at the time, actually. Um, but because he doesn't have a lot of poems at the, about the law, we needed to improvise a little bit. So that opening was read by our friend, John Ross, doing a pretty good accent, I think. And he um, was reading a poem that we asked ChatGPT 3.5 to write about the evils of qualified immunity, but in the style of Robert Burns. So there you have it. If you ever wondered what what that kind of poem might sound like, I think ChatGPT 3.5 did a pretty good job. Now, we are going to have a real show today, believe it or not. We're going to move on to a case from the Fifth Circuit and a case from the Seventh Circuit, both of which we think have a a bit of a Burns tie-in. And then we will close, so preview for later in the show, we will close with a real Burns poem read by a real actress who is a friend of the show. Um, So that's a little treat at the very end um, of this episode. But first... I am very happy to introduce our guest today, and it just so happens this he knows a thing or two about poetry much more than I do, and that's IJ attorney Brian Morris. So Brian, welcome back to Short Circuit. Great to be here. So Brian, uh, you are going to tell us about this case from the the Fifth Circuit that has a bit of a, a tie-in to Robert Burns, and um, you also maybe have something else to share. Yeah, you know, as a, I can sympathize with Burns, as as listeners may remember, I'm the resident Kentuckian here at IJ. Um, in my family, we're sharecroppers and tobacco farmers just a few short generations ago. We could also fill probably an entire episode debating scotch versus bourbon, which I, I will say for IJ listeners who are bourbon drinkers like myself and looking for a scotch, I would recommend, if I don't butcher the pronunciation, Glenn Morangy, um, which is, I think, a, a great a great introduction to the Scotch world for uh, uh, bourbon drinkers. But I mean, as an IJ, or also I can sympathize with you know Burns and his views against authority and his pre-romantic and liberalism ideas. But it's 
I've not read Burns since uh, my undergrad days as an English major, um, which are getting further and further behind me. But it was fun this week going back through his poetry. And I remember there's this one poem I, I really love. It's uh, A Man's a Man for a That, which was from 1795, just a year before his death. Yeah. And, um, you know, it talks about how a man is a man for being honest and not for his possessions or rank. So I, I figured I couldn't go through a Burns episode without trying my hand at a little poetry. Okay. So, <laughs> Lay it on us. Uh, not as good as an accent. I will, I will skip the accent like John Ross, but um, so it goes, What thou, O Hamely, fair we dine, where hodden gray and a that, guy fools their silks and knaves their wine, a man's a man for a that. For a that and a that, their tinsel show, and a that, the honest man, though e'er say poor, is king o' men for a that. So I think... Um, you know, as IJers and listeners of the show can agree too, we can agree with Burns' disdain for lords and dukes and wanting society uh, to be based on, as Burns said, sense and worth. So, that's lovely. That's lovely. It, he did have those views, although I, I think when he he almost lost a job he had because he he enunciated those views, and then he came crawling back and <laughs> denounced them all. But I think that was purely so he could keep his job. So that takes us, you know, a good segue to the, the case of the Fifth Circuit. So this just came out last week, which is Book People Inc. versus Wong, which was a Judge Willett um, opinion he wrote for the unanimous panel. But this is the case that relates to the new Texas law that's called the redis excuse me, the Restricting Explicit and Adult Designated Educational Resources Act. Um, <laughs> which perhaps uh, intentionally is short for the Reader Act, um, which requires book vendors who want to do business with Texas public schools to issue, to issue sexual content rating for every book they've ever sold or will sell in the future. Not, not just books they offer to schools, but any book they happen to sell themselves. Yeah, and so each, each vendor has to review each book and then determine whether they think that book is sexually explicit or sexually relevant. Um, and then each book gets a rating, sexually explicit, sexually relevant, or no rating. And then the vendors have to submit these ratings to the state, which posts the vendors' um, ratings on a website. And if the state disagrees with any of the rating, then it tells the vendor to change its rating. Um, and school districts can't purchase any sexually explicit books. And if parents uh, or if any student wants to check out a sexually relevant book, they have to have parental consent beforehand. And what does sexually relevant mean? That's a great question. Um, it's it's there's not a whole lot of direction in making these determinations. Um, it's just kind of there's these factors that the the vendors have to weigh. They have to determine whether something is graphic or whether a reasonable person would find the book. This is quote, intentionally panders to, titillates, or shocks the reader. So, um, you know, and, and then the, the, the back end is, is if, if a vendor is non-compliant, even on one rating for one book, schools are prohibited from buying for them. So, you know, I mean, as a side note, I think uh, I think it's easy to say which side of the law Burns would fall on on this. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what his poetry would be, would be rated. Well, that's a, I mean, one of the toasts during Burden's Night is for the lassies. So, um, I mean, if I was a book vendor in Texas, you might have to issue a sexual warning for a lot of Burns' work. Um, you know, I was going through some of the poems, and there's one. It's it's uh, one of his poems, Gree Grow the Rashes O, which um, has lines like, The sweetest hours that ever I spent are spent among the lasses O. And for you say... Deuce, you snee sneer at this. You're knocked but senseless asses o <laughs> the wisest man the world ever saw. He dearly loved the lasses o. So um, I don't. I'm not sure what the te Texas legislator would think about a lot of Burns' work or um, you know how many kids he had with how many women. Um, but you know, thinking back, I was like, you know, this law would apply to a lot of 18th and 19th century poets and authors. You know, I think back to reading Robert Browning and Oscar Wilde and, 
you know, Browning had more than one famous poem about sex, love, and murder. <laughs> and all of these all of these authors would have trouble under Texas's new law, which came up during the briefing and oral argument where Texas kind of admitted this. They said under the Reader Act, a book vendor would very likely have to add sexual ratings to literary classics like Romeo and Juliet, To Kill a Mockingbird, and even Lonesome Dove. So perhaps unsurprisingly, there was a First Amendment challenge to this <laughs> and uh, its restrictions. So there was a group of plaintiffs, but the main ones are two Texas bookstores and book vendors. And as any public interest attorney knows, Texas started with a barrage of jurisdictional arguments to try and avoid the merits. So Texas made arguments like there was no standing, this wasn't ripe because they were still kind of trying to figure out enforcement mechanisms. And the Fifth Circuit rejected all of these. Um, for standing, as listeners may remember, there's the three classic requirements of an injury, in fact, that's fairly traceable to the defendant um, and that is redressable or able to be fixed by the court, assuming they win. So here there's definitely an injury, the Fifth Circuit said. The law forbids the plaintiffs from selling books to the public schools unless they comply with the rating system. And one of the bookstores was explaining for them, 20% of their business is with public schools. So if they if they don't comply, they instantly lose 20% of their business across the board. Um, but if they did comply, it was estimating costs between $200 and $1,000 per book Wow! to review them and rate. So, I mean, that company was saying all told it would cost them hundreds of millions of dollars to comply and their annual sales is a million. So oh my that's, a, goodness. that's a pretty legit injury. And um, I mean, in the briefing, it gets into the, the weeds a little bit more, but it, the largest, I think they said, the largest six public schools in Texas have over six million books in their collections. And so it'd be astronomical to think how much it would cost for vendors to review and rate every single one of these books. Um, it's so, pretty insane. You think what you say, well, hey, employee, go read the library and tell me yeah. what's in there. Yeah. Yeah, and if and if you get it wrong, you're in noncompliance with the state and you can't sell any books to the schools. Yeah. So I think the the traceability and redressability elements were a little easier. Um, the injury relates directly to the state's enforcement of the law, and if the court enjoins the state from enforcing it, it would eliminate this catch-22 that all these book vendors find themselves in. So there's also, um, we don't have to talk about it much, but there's a ripeness challenge and a, you know, an immunity ex parte young challenge, and the Fifth Circuit kind of disposed of those pretty quickly. So it finally gets to the merits, um, seemingly more than halfway through the opinion. Uh, but the, the bookstores, bookstores argued that the rating system was compelled speech. So under the First Amendment, there's kind of two sides to the coin. You have the right to speak freely, and you also have the right to refrain from speaking at all. So it reminds me of the, the 303 Creative uh, Supreme Court case from last term, which that was a website designer who under Colorado law would have been compelled to design a website she disagreed with. So Justice Gorsuch wrote for the majority and talked about kind of how creative professionals like artists and writers shouldn't be forced to choose between producing speech they disagree with or remaining silent or speaking their minds and getting punished for doing so. And so here, that's pretty much what's happening is Texas is forcing book vendors to either stay silent and lose out on a massive part of their business or be forced to produce speech, which are the ratings that they disagree with. So the Fifth Circuit, I like how they put it. They said, speak as a state demands or suffer the consequences. And that's compelled speech. So in response, Texas raised essentially three defenses or exceptions to the compelled speech doctrine. They said, first, well, this is actually government speech. Government's doing the talking, not the, the vendors. And when government is the speaker, then the, the, the free speech clause just doesn't apply. But here, Texas isn't doing the speaking, right? The, the act requires the book vendors to rate the materials themselves. And that's very different than um, the Fifth Circuit explains. It's very different than a, you know, a government created warning label that you see on tobacco or alcohol. Which I mean, here I mean, Texas I think could do that if Texas wanted to review all the books and tell vendors, hey, slap this 
warning label on, um, that would be a different analysis. But that's not what's happening here. Here, the, the book vendors are required to go into this fact-intensive, costly analysis and then come up with their own ratings. And then there's there an argument that, well, the government puts these ratings on their website, so it's actually government speech. But on the website themselves, they they connect each rating with the actual vendor, um, and it's basically just an unedited list of ratings that the that was created by the book vendors. Right. So in the end of the day, it, it is the vendor's compelled speech, not the speech of Texas. And then the other exceptions were – Texas raised a, the what's called the government operations exception, which says, well, you know, the government can require you to speak when it's it's to preserve an orderly society or to disclose basic information. So think of it, this is the like let's say there's an IRS disclosure form or the demographic demographic information that you have to give in the census or the sex offender registry has been upheld under this exception. These are all some forms of compelled speech where the government is requiring you to disclose something. Um, but it's limited to basic demographic information or factual information. That doesn't apply to the ratings, the Fifth Circuit explained, which requires the vendors to undertake this, this deep contextual analysis and weighing factors, and it's necessarily this subject, subjective speech that they're they're engaging in. So the government, uh, Texas, similarly raised the, what's called the commercial speech exception. And that is, you know, states can compel speech in commercial advertising by requiring factual disclosures. And this is kind of along the lines of, you can think of nutrition labels. That's requiring the company to engage in some form of speech. But the Fifth Circuit explained that only applies, again, in purely factual and uncontroversial speech, you know, such as telling a consumer, hey, you're buying this product and it has X amounts of sugar in it or so much protein in it, right? Those are factual determination, factual speech um, that the, relates to consumers that the government can compel speech. But again, that doesn't apply here um, because the Texas law requires – the vendors to express a view or, or kind of passing judgment on something, right? That's very different than just a factual statement. And that was the theme at oral argument was that we talked about a little bit earlier. It, that's the trouble with this law is figuring out like what is sexually explicit. You know, it reminds me a little bit of Justice Potter Stewart's famous quote um, about pornography where he goes, yeah, I know it when I see it. It's right. kind of this, this object, subjective, well, I'm not quite sure what it is, but I think I'll know it if I see it or if I read it. Yeah, and he later disavowed that view too, because of course that's not even workable. But but here, it's not. I mean, I think everyone admits it's not. You know, it when you see it, because people have will have a different uh, take on a particular book. Exactly, and there's different different communities in different parts of Texas. What might be, you know, explicit in in Dallas may be very different than a small you know farming community. So. In the end, you know, Texas is not requiring vendors to make these simple factual statements about books or a product. Um, it wants them to, to force them to engage in this these pretty tough, I think, judgment calls on what may or may not be not only just sexually explicit, but sexually relevant, um, which are which are very, I think, kind of tough calls to make. So in the end, neither none of these exceptions apply. So the Fifth Circuit said the reader law does compel the speech of the vendors and that they would be harmed without the injunction in place stopping the enforcement of the law. So the Fifth Circuit uh, affirmed the district court, and this was um, perhaps a surprising but a nice win for the First Amendment in the, first, in the Fifth Circuit. Yeah, I, and it, it, I guess it's su surprising in, in the sense that we, we see all sorts of stuff, uh, good and bad, uh, coming out of the Fifth Circuit these days. And we, of course have more than their fair share of opinions on on the show. The one thing I didn't really see the court getting into, and I did read the opinion, but not as closely as you did, that um, is the fact that this is, like these companies are choosing to enter into business with the government. And it maybe this just the state didn't lean on this all that much. 
And I think it probably would be a loser of an argument. But there's the play devil's advocate. There's something to be said that, um, you know, you don't have to do business with us. You can sell books on the private market all you want and, and rate them or not rate them however you want. But if you enter into business with the school district or whoever it is, then you need to do this stuff with your books. And so what's the big deal? You know, why isn't a, di a different standard under that relationship than it would be if it was, you know, true censorship? Yeah, and I think, I mean, that kind of went into some of the standing analysis as well. Is it's, it's the reality is, is these, some of these companies, there's just a, a, a huge portion of their business is with these school districts. And, you know, it's even, the law even requires, you know, let's say a, hypothetically a book vendor is like, hey, I'm, I'm done. I, I, there's no way I comply with this. I'm, I'm not going to sell. Well, that doesn't take them outside the purview of the law, right? It's if they've sold anything in the past and those books are sitting on the shelves, they still have to go back and rate them. Wait, so, so it was, I get, I didn't catch that. That is retroactive? Yeah, it's it's books they have sold or will sell. So it's if, if you've sold books to Texas, um, even if you're like, you know, I'm out, it, you still have to provide ratings for books that you've Why sold. Why would they include that in the law? Well, you know, if because they want to cover these books, I guess, that are sitting on the shelves in Texas schools um, for the ratings. And or because so, they wanted publicity from passing this law they knew that would be struck down perhaps, but that's a different yeah. story. Yeah, and that's it goes back to, you know, one of the – themes at oral argument was the, the book vendors were saying, hey, we're not we're not trying to say the, the state can't make decisions about curriculum or the books that children read in school or to protect kids from obscene material. But if the state wants to do that, the state needs to do that. It shouldn't be compelling these third parties and these companies from um, engaging in speech that they don't want to engage in. Right. And, and I, I see, I mean, this, this comes up that kind of argument by the government, well, you can opt in, you know, you don't have to. It, it comes up in all kinds of circumstances like we we at IJ will encounter in our occupational licensing cases, the state will say, well, you don't have to enter into this occupation. You could go do something else. But if you do choose to be, you know, what wh whatever it may be, psychiatrist or, uh, you know, uh, a horse mas masseuse, <laughs> all the occupations we've litigated, then you got to do all this stuff that maybe doesn't make any sense. Um, and so it's even, I think the, I think the, the key there is that, that courts sometimes forget. And I'm, I'm glad the court here remembered is that just because you're doing business of the government doesn't mean you're in a constitution free zone. Um, it, it, it still applies in all kinds of ways. Exactly. So um, where does the case go from here? This was a preliminary injunction, but it seems unless this gets reversed, there's not a lot of future to this law. I wouldn't think so. Yeah, it would, uh, I would imagine it, it, it goes back down um, and the district court can turn the the preliminary injunction into a permanent injunction. And, you know, there may be more factual findings um, related to, you know, different elements of the of the claims. But I, I would imagine unless something uh, surprising happens that this this law is not going anywhere. Well, the best laid plans of mice and men and Texas legislators. So. We will now turn to a, uh, I think that was a very closely tied to the spirit of Burns case. I think you did a great job there, there, Brian, um, bringing it out. This one's a little bit more tenuous, but it's a fun little case. It's actually kind of a warning to um, litigators out there, our, our lawyer listeners, as to what not to do. Um, when you're litigating, especially in a foreign jurisdiction where you're not licensed, it is, uh, and it is basically the tie in to Burns is you got to know when it's time to sing old Angsai. When you're done, the case is over, the year is over, you say goodbye to your friends, you walk away. You got, as we said a few weeks ago in a different context, you got to know when to hold them. You got to know when to fold them. This lawyer really didn't know when to fold them. And we could talk about, you know, whether he had a point or not, uh, too. So the case is, the, the underlying matter is called Bailey versus Worthington Cylinder Corporation. And it's actually part of a series of uh, lawsuits that are 
pretty mundane, pretty run of the mill uh, products liability stuff that usually you know wouldn't wouldn't make for a huge splash on on short circuit. Essentially, uh, there is a manufacturer of gas canisters for I think it's blow torches, and the the claim is they've been malfunctioning and um, injuring people. So there are, um, it's not just this case. This case was in the Northern District of Illinois in Chicago uh, originally, but there were other cases around the country. And so a California attorney, he was involved in this litigation. At one point, it, it, I think it's at least part of it, uh, tried to go to a multi-district litigation panel, um, but it got sent back to, to Chicago for whatever reason. And so he's from California. He's involved in these cases. And so he has a client who is suing the company in the Northern District of Illinois. It seems like the the venue is fine and all that, but he is not licensed in the Northern District of Illinois. It's pretty easy, uh, non-lawyer listeners, a uh, little bit of background. It, it usually is pretty easy to become a member of a federal district court. A uh, state court is, is is different, but as long as you're a member of a state bar, so California, uh, Virginia, New York, wherever, you can then pretty easily become a member of most federal district um, courts, including what I actually, I, I think I'm still a member of the Northern District, Illinois from my Chicago days. So instead of doing that though, probably because he really did just have this one case in mind, he pro hocs in. So pro hoc vice, the Latin term we use to mean a lawyer who's just appearing for one case in, in a jurisdiction. Now to do that, you have to say where you're licensed and what your record is essentially in your home communities where you are licensed and this being California for this guy. So you got to say if you were ever reprimanded by the bar, that doesn't mean you won't be able to wave in necessarily, but you know, it raises an eyebrow. It's kind of like a criminal background check. And so he says, I'm fine. Uh, everything's fine back in California. So it he gets his pro hoc and then they get in the litigation. And from what I can tell, I think there's a lot going on here that's not in the opinion or the, the underlying opinion. I didn't read. There's a lot of opinions, but there was one specifically at the district court that, that I looked over. Um, I, I think this was very contentious litigation. And at one point, the defense counsel moved to remove his pro hoc status, to kick him out of the case. Kind of a big deal. And they said it's because of, they had various arguments. And one was that he didn't disclose something that had happened back home in California. Now, I don't know the ins and the outs of this. I looked at it very quickly. From what I could tell, it was a kind of a technical thing, but this is a word of warning to litigators out there, and this comes out at IJ too, so everyone should, should take note of this. In our age of e-filing, where we have you sign something, right? In the old days, you would sign it with a pen, you would mail it to the court, mail copies to opposing counsel. These days, so much is e-filing where you scan your signature, or you may even just type the signature in, and that's the electronic signature. There is often still a requirement that you sign a copy and then retain the quote, wet signature with the actual pen and actual ink. And can the court enforce this? Well, usually not, but the, the court can technically come to you like two years later and say, oh, do you have that wet signature on file? Um, it hardly ever happens. I don't know if I've ever heard of it otherwise happening, but for whatever reason, this was a few years ago now, but this it, it, it was the same kind of rule. And this guy got found out for not keeping his wet signature. So word of warning, litigators out there, ah, oh, yeah, that doesn't matter. We'll just toss it in the trash and file the scan copy. Keep your wet signatures for God knows my, what might happen. So he gets found out for this and it goes into, he appeals it in California and the court was kind of admonished him, but he thinks it wasn't really a bar discipline. Um, but the court, here in Illinois says, yeah, I think that was bar discipline. But for whatever reason, the magistrate judge in the case does not remove his pro hoc status. They're like, no, you know, he, yeah, maybe he's a little annoying, but we're not going to remove it right now. But then he makes a mistake um, because they appeal, the defense counsel actually appeal that from the magistrate judge to the district judge just on this 
removing his pro hoc. So this isn't like a final judgment or preliminary injunction or anything like that. This is just removing this guy's pro hoc status. They appeal to the district judge, which is, I don't think I've ever heard of any of this before. And they say that not only did he do this or whatever else they were annoyed at, but he had been asking the magistrate judge to recuse himself because he used to work for the a firm that's involved in another matter that he was involved with in Illinois. I think it's kind of the same set of cases. And um, he should have recused himself. Now, he used to work at this firm, this big firm that everyone knows at, uh, around the country, including in Chicago, Holland and Knight. So he worked at Holland and Knight. He left that, became a magistrate judge, and apparently some lawyers from Holland and Knight represented this uh, one of these cases before him. But he said, you know, I left the firm before they retained counsel. So there's not a, I mean, sure, I used to work I, well, alongside these guys, but that's not a conflict. The ethical rules shows that's not a conflict. And you can make an argument as whether it should be a conflict or not, but it's not a conflict under rules. So this really ticks off the district court judge who says, all right, you got this, you're complaining about the magistrate judge. That's way out of bounds. You also had this other stuff. I disagree. I actually am going to throw you off the case. So he's removed pro hoc. He appeals that. But the thing is, the case is still going, right? So you can only appeal a case while it's still going in, in the trial court for certain reasons. One is what Brian just talked about, the preliminary injunction. That's something you can appeal. There's not a lot of other exceptions. Another one is if you lose on a qualified immunity motion and you're a, you're an officer, uh, then you can do that, unfortunately. But you can't for this th pro hoc thing. Because, I mean, after all, you're the lawyer, not the, the actual party. So um, he's told he can't do that. And then they get, later in the case, um, the case settles. I think the guy was, the, his client was representing himself pro se for a while. But anyway, the case settles. Case is over. In that that part of the case, in that, in that district, his client, case is done. Nevertheless, he appeals to the Seventh Circuit. And so that's where we get to the actual opinion um, that, that came out uh, earlier this week. And he says, okay, I get the case is over. Um, so you might think this is all moot, but my reputation has been damaged by my this pro hoc status being taken away from me. And I demand that you tell the district court judge that he was wrong in order to rehabilitate myself. And the court goes through some, um, uh, some, uh, factors about mootness and and uh, case being over and all that. Usually that we talk about on this show when it has to do with, you know, ongoing constitutional violation or constitutional violation of the past, that kind of thing. Here it's whether he should have been removed from this case or not. And the court says, you know, it, sorry, the case is over. Um, maybe you didn't like what happened to you in the past, but courts malign all kinds of people in their opinions not just attorneys and you can't just have everyone suing about that. And so this is the end of the road. Uh, let's sing tales of old anxiety and you can go back to California. Um, they do say though, that if like, if there was a really crazy um, arbitrary result in district court where someone lost their pro hoc and they really thought it was unfair and the client really needed them, they could essentially ask for a writ of mandamus at, at the Court of Appeals. That's kind of your break break glass and emergency writ that we, we have talked about in the show before. And that so that could be an option. But they explicitly say that his situation would not qualify. They say, we add, however, that this particular order is not one for which we would find a writ of mandamus appropriate. So... He's out of luck. This is now in the, the, the federal reporter and uh, has to go back and litigate in California. You know, that's, <clears throat> I love old Zang sign. It always reminds me of one of my favorite renditions is at the end of it's a wonderful life. And it's um, not, not quite the magical ending for this guy, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, man, this guy just doesn't know when to quit. You know, if I understand the timing correctly, so the magistrate denies the motion at first, and he thinks, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna go after this magistrate and talk some more, <laughs> you know, crap about him. 
So then, it, I mean, it gets worse for him. And then the, the district judge is like, no, 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 you're out of here. Yeah. Um, which is just wild. And it's it reminds me... Um, it reminds me of one of our cases we have here at IJ is it's the Upsolve case, which is currently pending in front of the Second Circuit, which is we're challenging part of New York's unauthorized practice of law, the, those restrictions under the First Amendment. And there's this poor, disbarred attorney who thinks if we win, um, then all law licenses are unconstitutional and he gets to practice again, right? And he, the court just denied, just in the Second Circuit alone, denied his third motion to intervene in the case. Um, and there was even more in the district court. So, um, I mean, if nothing else, you got to respect these guys. They have no quit in them, so. <laughs> yeah, you, maybe the two go together, the two impulses uh, a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it's also just, it's bizarre too. It's just why, you know, it's not like the court... It's not like he's in California and they revoked his bar status, right? This is like a one-off pro hoc admission in Illinois, which um, I mean, I'm sure. I mean, I guess in some sense it could affect future pro hoc admissions elsewhere, but um, it seems like quite the quite the the fight to pick. Yeah, and I have to say, in the ab, I mean, I don't have a lot of sympathy for this guy, but in the abstract, um, I do think it's a little troubling that you might not have a a remedy here, and so it's good that they add this thing about getting a writ of mandamus. Um, but, you know, if the court uh, maligns you or, or uh, maybe, you know, maybe it rises to the level of, of uh, libel or defamation, there seems like maybe there should be some kind of remedy. Now, of course, you're, you're not going to be able to sue the judge. There's the absolute immunity um, that listeners of Bound by Oath know know all about and in, in suing a judge if you don't like what the, what the judge does. So usually your only avenue for some kind of relief is to appeal um, but I, I, I think in this set of facts, uh, it was, um, it was time to, uh, to ring in the new year. Well, the last case that I'm going to talk about, uh, is very briefly, it just in the spirit of, of it being January 25th is a case that few of you may remember from law school. So this is an old case, but it is a case uh, where where Robert Burns comes up. So I did, uh, for fun, I looked at when Burns has been cited in um, the federal and state courts, in, in American federal and state courts. And, you know, for any author, any famous author, judges can't help themselves to quote them from time to time. And maybe more clerks, when they're drafting the opinions, can't help themselves. Um, I definitely was guilty of that when I was a clerk. So... Uh, you know, if you if you search Shakespeare in the Federal Reporter, you'll find all kinds of references. You know, where judges are just think they'll do a turn of phrase or whatever. And we had an episode a couple of years ago about um, judges just getting way too into pop culture references and referencing pop culture. So this is kind of a more erudite version of that, but it, it definitely happens. There's all kinds of you know cites to Dickens or to the, the the fellows you mentioned or Wordsworth or you know whoever it may be. Well. Uh, I said, well, who, who side burned? Well, it wasn't as much as I would have expected, but almost entirely, they are to um, the poem To a Mouse, and specifically the line, The Best Laid Plans of Mice and Men. Because there's so many of these cases, right? It, it you're, You say, okay, so this was set up, and then the best laid plans of mice and men, everything went wrong, right? Everyone ran the court and sued each other. That's the, that's the story so many times. So um, that was no different um, in this case, but this case is, 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 is different actually in that it actually did concern a mouse. Um, so we'll put a link in the show notes. Again, I'm not going to go into it. It's a very short case. I could have read it probably to you on, on the show in a cup in, in just a couple minutes. But um, someone bought a bottle of Coke in Mississippi and they opened it up. They had a few swallows until they realized there was a decomposing mouse in the bottle of Coke. So they sue the bottling company. They bought it from a store, but the store got it from this, this distributor who got it from the bottling company. And um, anyway, there's 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 quotes to uh, to the poem that you guys will hear in a little bit uh, to a mouse, and um, 
I think the key line is the bottling company says, we have this amazing system, a uh, clean system where we ensure that our product is safe. And um, this guy actually got sick from, from drinking this, uh, this Coke, unsurprisingly. And, um, and so there's no way that the mouse could have got in there. And so the court lays that out and he goes, nevertheless, the little creature was in the bottle. So what does that mean? Company's liable. So a little bit of uh, products liability um, law for you that, Brian, you said you, you might have read this like in torts or something. I remember reading this in torts and thinking, you know, part of me was it would be interesting to see a, a modern day camera to figure out how the mouse got into the, <laughs> the, the bottle. <laughs> um, but I love the line right before they quote Burns where it's suffice it to say he did not get joy from the anticipated refreshing drink. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, it's um, it's going to make you think twice every time you open a bottle from from now on. Uh, at, you know, you should inspect your bottles. So, in any case, this is one of the most beloved of of Burns's poems. I think because it, it doesn't get into controversial stuff like we were talking about earlier or politics. It's it's, but it is a, a little bit of an environmental tinge to it. So the poem, the full title, is "To a Mouse." on turning her up in her nest with the plow. And we have a special treat. So um, we have a up-and-coming young actress in the Twin Cities area. Her name is Adelaide Dixon, or Addie Dixon, um, reading the poem to you. She's been in many productions, many theater productions. I will disclose, she is also a friend of our family, um, but she's a great actress, and she jumped at the opportunity to read this poem to all of you. So we will close with To a Mouse. Uh, first, I want to say the next couple of weeks, we have some great non-IJ guests coming. Um, I think you will enjoy both of the shows that we have lined up with these um, special guests. So look forward to that. Raise a glass to, to justice, to liberty, to Robert Burns, to Scotland, whatever you want uh, of your, your favorite tipple tonight at, at Burns Night. And also, I want all of you to get engaged. We sleek it, curin timorous beastie. Oh, what the panic's in thy breastie. Thou need not start away say hasty with bicker and brattle. I would be laith to rin and chase thee with murder and prattle. I'm truly sorry men's dominion has broken nature's social union and justifies that ill opinion which makes thee startle at me, thy poor earth-born companion and fellow mortal. I doubt now, Wells, but thou my thieve. What then, poor beastie? Thou mourn live. A daemon icker in a thrave, so small request. I'll get a blessing with a lave and never missed it. Thy wee bit housey, too, in ruin, its sill walls the winds are strewn, and Nathan now to beg a new one of foggage green, and bleak December's winds and soon, baith snell and keen. Thou saw the fields laid bare and wast, and weary winter coming fast, and cozy here beneath the blast, thou thought to dwell, till crash, the cruel coulter passed out through thy cell. That wee bit heap o' leaves and stibble has cost thee money a weary nibble. Now thou's turned out for all thy trouble, but house or hold to thaw the winter's sleety dribble and cranuch cold. But mousy, thou art no thy lane, and proving foresight may be vain. The best laid schemes o' mice and men gang aft a glay, and lee us now but grief and pain for promised joy. Still, thou art blessed compared with me. The present only toucheth thee. Bach, I backward cast my ye on prospects drear, and forward, though I can ye see, I guess and fear. <laughs>